this word anymore. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to church. Thank you for joining us. If you are in at the first service, we appreciate you. Thank you for being part of what we do. I hope you enjoyed the teaching, or you were blessed, actually, not enjoyed, the teaching on the law of the rubber band, part two, where Pastor Mark th took us through um, the scriptural perspective of the law of the rubber band. Thank you and welcome. If you just give me a moment, I need to set my dogs in a row. I need to do my broadcast so that your brothers and sisters may come in. But as you wait for me to do that, can we begin to pray? Let's pray and commit to this, um, this service into the hands of God. Let's ask that in his mercy, he would then speak to us by his spirit. Let it be that I am just a tool and it's not about me. That we'll hear his voice in order that we will do this evening and that his name will be glorified in the name of Jesus. Almighty Father, the God of all flesh, I am thankful for the grace to sit here. When I woke up this morning, I didn't think that I'll be able to sit here. Thank you for helping, oh God. Thank you for your healing power. Lord, I submit and I surrender to your will and your will alone this afternoon. I am asking in the name of Jesus that you will speak to your children. I pray, oh God, concerning the hearts of the people that have come. Father, Lord, that they would be receptive hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Almighty God, the God of all flesh, I ask that the word will be easy, that it will be simple, and it will make sense to those who need it. Lord, for as many as might have to encounter a distraction, Father, we pray ahead, O God, that you give them the resilience to follow through in the name of Jesus. Let your name be glorified at the end of this day. And you know, concerning all that you will use us to do here. Let your name be glorified, O oh God. Thank you, God of heaven, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Good afternoon again. Welcome to church. This is the World Oasis International. My name is Bidemi Makmodi, and um, I'll be your teacher this evening. If it's your first time, we are happy to have you in our midst. Last week, we looked at part four of the series we've been on, the series on sonship. And the goal of this series is to teach us um, and help us recognize the processes that we need to go through to be fully mature children of God. Because as with anything that is life, we don't come into God and remain at the same spot. In coming into God, we're supposed to grow and in growing, maturation is one of the major things that we look at. Our foundation scripture for all of this series, which is going to be about a 12 or 13 part series, our foundation scripture is, um, is found in um, Galatians chapter 4 from verse number 1 to about verse 4. The highlight is verse 2 and 3 where it talks about every child that's the hair, child, even though he's the hair, does not gain, get to receive any inheritance until he's been get taken through, until he's been he's submitted or been processed through a tutor and a governor. And we have um, always said in the course of this, um, in the course of this um, of this series, that it is extremely important <coughs> that we don't remain at the same spot in our work with God. Last week we looked at the Napier son. And in looking at the Napier son, we looked at a believer at infancy, a believer at infancy, the infancy stage of sonship, where you come into God and you are so focused on yourself. Even God is focused on you in that, um, at, in the, at that stage of your life. What I find in um, uh, what we talked about at the Napier stage is that um, is that stage where because you just gave your life to Christ, anything you need, anything you ask, you receive. It's really exciting. It is fun, fun to be in the Napier. We also said that um, one of the characteristics of a Napier's believer is, um, is selfishness. The Napier's believer is just 
focused on himself. As far as he's concerned, he's the best thing that happened since a slice of bread. He expects that everyone would line up to do his will, and that is inclusive of God himself. This week we want to move, because today's teaching is a bit much, is we want to move to um, the next stage of maturation in sonship, and that is the paid-on son, P-A-I-D-O-N. P-A-I-D-O-N, the paid-on son. This is the next stage of maturation. If the Napier's son or the Napier's believer is the child who is between infancy and toddler, that's anywhere between year one, um, birth and year, maybe max year three. The paid-on believer is the believer or is the son who is up to who is up to, who is between five between three and twelve years old in man years if we're going to look at a child who is a paid on today in the physical we'll be looking at a child who is between three years and twelve years now we will see and our prime example will be um what's his name would be Jesus himself and as, as well as the man Peter or the disciple Peter in the Bible. But as we go on, the, the, the tendency is you begin to recognize you in the, in, the, in the course of the teaching of the things or the characteristics of a paid on son. Now, that you are a paid on son does not mean that something is wrong with you. Not even a Napier son has something wrong with him. It's just to highlight for us the need to consistently, um, what's the word, mature in our work with God. That's what this series is about. And to help you trace your growth, you know, whether you're growing or you're standing at the same spot. That's what all of this is about. Now, when you look at the word paid on, paid on means a half-grown boy or girl. Literally, that's what it means. Half-grown boy or girl or a more advanced child. In its root word, which is a Greek word, a paid on is a more advanced child or a half-grown boy or girl. In one word, the paid on is still immature. A little child mature enough to understand and proclaim, but doesn't have the capacity to be able to, does not have the wisdom and the experience, and sometimes the humility to be able to take on board the things that he's learned in his journey with God. So the paid on believer is a child who is a little child, mature enough to understand and proclaim that he's a believer, mature enough to see that <coughs> the need for nurturing his relationship with God, mature enough to know what is good or wrong in his, follow in his following of God. But there are many things that a paid on believer is not able to um, embrace and work with because he's still at the stage where he's maturing. Now, like with every other child who is paid on in real life, the, the, the reality is no parent gives a paid on child um, inheritance. Um, when someone, if someone, even if someone's father was a king and their father died prematurely and they were just in this age, they would always appoint a regent to run the throne or, yes, run the throne or sit on the throne or beside his throne i don't know which is the correct expression until this child is old enough he needs to go through schooling he needs to have graduated there is a, a maturity that is required for you to be able to step into the level of kingship in life so it's not different in the spiritual things as well there are many things that god may not will not actually commit into our hands if we remain at the paid on stage the believer in the paid on stage obviously has moved away from infancy he's no longer still um, feeding on milk and milk alone he still goes back to milk once in a while but that's not his main meal now his main meal is eating meat he's He's been even given responsibility. Let's look at parents. If you, are, um, if you have a child, there are things you would not tell your, your two-year-old to go and bring you, we talked about it last week, to go and bring you a kettle of hot water. You wouldn't even have asked him to go and bring you a bowl of cold water because he doesn't have the capacity to be able to do that yet. But when you have a five-year-old child, you can ask your five-year-old child to go to the tap and fetch you a cup of water. You can ask your five-year-old child, for those who are really great parents, you can ask five, my sister, one of my younger sister's five-year-old mop, 
the floor. I don't know how to do it. I keep telling them it's child abuse. They don't listen. But they do it. Their children at that age are doing dishes. They're doing all of those things. But you see, this is because they're teaching these children responsibility. You get it. So the, the, the main thing that a pagan believer needs to learn is responsibility amongst many other things. Now, um, there is a man that I respect when it comes to um, teaching. I know he's one of the rare people that I follow. His name is Sam Solin. Sam Solin, in his description of a pagan believer, has this to say. He says, this little child of God has matured beyond themselves, enough to truly know the character and nature of the Father, knowing both his intimacy and sovereignty. During this season of knowing, the child will be in a place to finally receive the Father's blessing on his life. For the first time, he truly begins to enter and experience the kingdom of faith. The child grows in strength, he grows in wisdom, and he grows in grace. So the pagan believer is interacting with God. He started an interaction with God. You know, so um, in, in today's church, they are now in um, Sunday school. They are expected to take assignments home and work on them, even though they still try to water down um, I call it watered down. Well, the word that they use is simplify. Simplify the teaching so that the paid on believer understands it. But the point is the paid on believer knows now what is wrong and what is right in his follow of God. If you go with me to our first scripture <coughs> of the day, we'll go to John, uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 13. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 13. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Classic. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 13. It says, I'm writing to you, fathers, because you have come to know, recognize, be aware of, and understand him who has existed from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have been victorious over the wicked one. I write to you, boys, lads, because you have come to know, recognize, and be aware of the father. The last limb I write to you boys is addressed to the paid on believer. The, the second one I am writing to you young men is addressed to the, um, I think that's the heroes believer. The next one is the technon believer. But today, of course, we are focusing on the paid on believer. So the part of this scripture that I'm interested in is if you were taking it, it will be um, 13 ABC. I'm in, interested in um, first John chapter. See, it says, I write to you, boys, lads, because you have come to know, recognize, and be aware of the Father. Do you understand this? So, when we look at the paid unbeliever, what you will find from that scripture is that the paid unbeliever, it is safe to say that a paid unbeliever has gotten a personal awareness of God, he doesn't require spoon feeding anymore. So the child who is a paid unbeliever, or the, or yes, when we have a child, for instance, who falls with this, this, within this age range, that's when the child has a headache. If he's watched, watched his parents pray when they have a headache before, or proud to that time, if they had a headache and they say, oh, my head hurts, then the parents come and say, come, let me lay hands on you and pray. The paid unbeliever now knows, that child knows that when they have a headache, one of the things they do in their home is to come and pray. If that's what they do. My own children at that point know that we go for communion as well. Do you understand it? So this child is recognizing not just um, the fact that there is a God, but recognizing the role of spiritual disciplines in growing up as a believer. The pagan believer begins to understand the way God works and recognizes the need for obedience and a close walk with God. The paid on believer begins to value the relationship with father and understands the need to keep going. So that's the believer. He's excited. He knows that he's interacting with something new and something great. But he's not at the infancy level where he thinks it is, it is about him. He has been tutored a bit to recognize that he has a, rep, a responsibility and he has contributions to make on this journey 
with God. Now, I'll tell you one story of myself as a paid on believer. And I'll come back to that story many, many times. When I got born again and in the first, say, one year after I got born again, I was in a church that was young and was vibrant. And one of the things, the gift that the Lord gave me at that early was the gift of dreams. If I dreamt, you know, I, there was no way I would dream and see A and the thing would manifest in the life of B. If I dreamt and I saw Mr. A, everything that happened in that dream will happen to Mr. A. But of course, I was a paid unbeliever. What that meant was that I didn't have enough experience and wisdom on how to reveal revelation. So even if I dreamt that someone died, I would just blot it out. That got me in trouble. Don't ask me how, but it got me in big trouble, okay? But the idea is that when you are a paid unbeliever, God will speak to you. He will do things with you. But you're at that stage where you must take that which God is committing into your hands and take back to your tutors and your governors, the ones who are discipling you, so that they will help you process. That's the thing that uh, one of the things, uh, the gaps we have in the body of Christ. A lot of paid on believers are ministering to other people. They have not been processed enough. No doubt God commits revelation in their hands, okay? It's not in doubt at all. They can hear God. They know God. And God wants them to know him even more. So he teaches them something. But what should happen in the level of a paid on believer is when you get to receive those things from God, you ought to go to your tutors. You ought to go to your governors. Classic example, we used him last week, is the boy Samuel. Samuel was in, he was a paid on believer when God first spoke to him. But if you notice, even when God called him, he went first to Eli. The first time, the second time, the third time, before it even occurred to Eli that it was God that was Samuel. So paid on believers ought to recognize that I can now hear God for myself. I, I, I still have a need to submit to those who are a bit more experienced so that they will teach me how to handle and steward revelation properly. But of course, we live in an age where those things don't happen anymore. Everybody just wants to be the boss of themselves. So we're finding more and more um, mistakes and brokenness in the body because people within this stage, and I, I remember I told you that I did it. So maybe I did it because no one taught me. But you are hearing now, so you are, now you know. But if you are a paid on believer, you ought to be a bit more careful. Okay, so let's go on because of time. The reason the paid on believer doesn't need to be as close marked as the Napier's believer is simply because the paid on believer not only knows the benefits of a close work with Father, but he actually enjoys that, that work already. He knows enough to put in the time that is required in the place of study. He knows enough to put in the time that is required in the place of prayer. He knows enough to put in the time in attending services where they are, where they are available. In Matthew 18, 2-5, Jesus benchmarks the pagan as a model of how to come to him. So the pagan believer has, has this excitement around him. If, if I don't know about you, but when I was a pagan believer, I, I didn't know anything like tiredness. If they asked me to come for service 15 times a day, I show up because the joy of the Lord was the bubble that I had. It made me consistently come. If they asked me to come many, many times, I would show up. It was exciting for me to hear, to sit down with my friends to discuss the word of God. At the stage of the pagan believer, for me, all my conversations, somebody will say that's what I still do, but all my conversations were peppered with God, the Holy Spirit, Jesus. And it was exciting, and it was even more exciting to be able to say to someone, and God told me. So it's that place, but because we are lacking in experience at that level, the tendency is the paid on believer can make very costly mistakes. And what we're trying to see today is how to ensure that that doesn't happen. In that Matthew chapter 18, Jesus said, um, um, said um, how does he say it? Um, let the child, little children come to me. Or he also said that, you know, to, for, if you come to him, you have to be as a child. Okay, so let's go on. The hallmark of a paid unbeliever. What are the characteristics of a paid unbeliever? Number one, he starts to learn humility. 
Remember that what I said was he's beginning to. He's not too tall in full blown humility well, yet, but he knows it. He recognizes that I have to be humble when the call is made on him. But it is not something that comes naturally to him at that point. The paid on believer trusts God, no doubt at all. I don't know. I think that the greatest miracles that happen in the life of believers happen at the paid on level. Because the paid on believer is foolish enough to believe that what God said, God will do it. These days, as the, the older we get, we begin to rationalize that there's some prayers that God will answer. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And there are some prayers God will won't answer. There are some that we, He will answer immediately. There are some that are going to take a while. The paid on, paid on believer has no filters like that. As far as it's concerned, if he asks God, God had to do it and do it now. And so I received more. I received more. Um, exciting answers to prayer at that stage of my life because it didn't matter if you told me your grandmother was dead i will lay hands on her i i the paid believer doesn't believe that there is something called i can feel he's too excited by the fact that he now belongs to jesus to be considering whether he's what he says what god says he will do god will not do it he has everything in his mind he's just God said it, I believe it, that settles it. That's where that expression comes from. So the paid believer trusts God. He never doubts what he hears. The paid believer is excited to receive. So the paid believer would, would give a testimony over a pen. He will give a testimony about a bottle of water. The paid believer will give a, a testimony over a car. There are no, um, as far as the paid believer is concerned, he, everything that he receives from God is a miracle. Now, the idea is that you never lose that because as you mature, you're not supposed to graduate from being Napiers and never, you are supposed to mature, but there are certain qualities as being at, at the Napiers level and at the pagan level that you don't, don't leave behind. But what I have found as I have grown, unless I'm, I'm intentional and conscious of it, is that I now grew where a bottle of water would have just been enough for me to go to church on Sunday and give a testimony. Now I look at it and I'm thinking at my age, I should get a tanker of water. What is a bottle of water? I'm now grading the things, my, my miracles in God. Not that good. Uh, the pagan believer is also very exuberant. What does that mean? He, because he has no filters, he says everything that he hears the Holy Spirit say. And he doesn't pass, he doesn't believe in couching it properly. He, you know, there's no wisdom there. There's no filters. That's the expression. He, because of exuberance, he jumps, he, he screams, he just does all of those things. Why? Because he's paid on. He's still growing. Consequently, because he's exuberant and he has a spiritual opinion on almost everything, you can always tell a paid on believer in a group of believers. He's the one that argues everything. Because as far as it's concerned, it's in the Bible. What are you saying? He will argue everything. He's the one that woke up, went for evangelism, and will spend three hours in one house arguing scripture that he's not really adept at yet. But that's because he's excited. He's excited about everything. So he has an opinion about everything. And depending on their personality, the way most people see the paid believer is that he's brash. And sometimes he's rude. His brash, his judgmental, and his, the pagan believer is the one that will look at someone and say, you are going to hell. He doesn't know how to say it nicely. Now, is he stating the truth? Yes. But should he say to his grandfather's age mate, you are going to hell like that? In Africa, we don't talk like that. We look for a way to couch it. But the pagan believer doesn't care. I just tell you, so now here you go, so. And then that makes it difficult for him to make impact because the people he's talking to get offended easily and they react to what he's saying. Hallelujah. So consequently, because he's all these things, he's learning humility. He trusts God exceedingly. He's beginning to understand the nature of God. He's excited to receive all things. He's exuberant and he's, he has an opinion about everything. What you find about the paid believer is that his sense of boundaries is almost non-existent. 
He doesn't understand the scripture that says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. If it is occurs to him, he should just do it or say it. The pagan believer is the one who would walk up to somebody's husband and try to restitute sleeping with their wife because he has no filters. He has heard in church last Sunday that restitution is something that God believes in and it's a principle of God. And then he doesn't pass it through any filters. He goes and he sees a man holding a dagger and he said, I just came to apologize. Say, what did I do? What did you do? I slept with your wife. How does he end up? If the guy has a temper, he ends up dead. So that's because he has no sense of boundaries and he, has, he doesn't recognize that some things have to be properly prayed through, properly um, superintended over before he can get into them. The reason why he looks like he has no boundaries is because the Padian believer is hungry for more knowledge. He enjoys knowledge. He is gulping it. As far as he's concerned, all his paws are mouths. He wants to take on more and more and more of God. The Padian believer is having a blast. That's the truth. He's enjoying his relationship with God. But most of the time, he does that at the expense of other believers. His other relationships suffer because he is, he does, he's the one that now needs nobody but God. And he does not understand the scripture that says that God puts the solitary in families. If you look at Luke chapter 2, I want us to go there. Luke chapter 2, you will see Jesus, the paid unbeliever. Luke chapter 2, from verse 40 to 52. This is the story of when they went to Jerusalem for the feast. And then, let me read from verse 42. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as was their custom. And when the feast was ended, they were returning. The boy Jesus remained, note that they said the boy Jesus, remained behind in Jerusalem. Now his parents did not know this. Causing him to be in the caravan, they traveled on a day's journey. And then they sought him diligently, looking up and down for him among their king's folk and acquaintances. And when they failed to find him, they went back to Jerusalem, looking for him up and down all the way. After three days, they found him, came upon him in the court of the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were astonished and overwhelmed with bewildered wonder at his intelligence and understanding and his replies. And when they, that's Joseph and Mary, his earthly father, saw him, they were amazed and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Here your father and I have been anxiously looking for you, distressed and tormented. They lost the baby Jesus. Can you understand that? They took Jesus to the market and they lost him. That meant that they've lost the savior of the world. I understand their distress and I understand their torment. But look at Jesus' response to them in verse 49. And he said to them, how is it that you had to look for me? Did you not see and know that it is necessary as a duty for me to be in my father's house and occupied about my father's business? Verse 50 says, but they did not comprehend what he was saying. He was speaking out of the fullness of his revelation of his assignment, the reason he came. Even though his mother had been hinted, but they didn't expect it to happen that early. So they found him, instead of him, because he's paid on, to just turn and say, I'm sorry, daddy, I'm sorry, mommy, let's go home. He first of all actually chastised and said, why are you looking for me? You think it's because of you I came. I'm in my father's house. I'm doing my father's business. Verse 51 shows you that he's learning Humility. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was habitually obedient to them. And his mother kept and closely and persistently guarded all these things in her heart. Verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom, in broad and full understanding, and in stature, and in years, and in favor with God and man. So you see, he acted as paid on. And then verse 52 says, he increased in wisdom. That's just to show that even Jesus at that point in his chronological age and maturity needed to go through some level of maturity. Okay? 
So if Jesus needed to go through that level, who will you be? So let's analyze the story. The child grew and was strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. He was 12 years old, and he went up to Jerusalem with his parents. At the end of the time, you see how it is. But thank God he ended in the fact that he went home with them. He stayed with them and habitually was obedient to them. And then he waxed. He increased in wisdom. The Bible in the Amplified Classic says, in broad and full understanding and in favor with God and in man. What this simply means is that when you are at the stage of the pagan believer, I'm saying this, but I need to say it carefully. You will find that if you act exactly like the pagan, you don't get to enjoy much favor with men because you rob them roughly. Okay? But let's go on. If there was one person in the Bible who had a lot of showing at his pagan stage, however, it's the man Apostle Peter. Uh -uh, that guy, he, 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 he consistently, this is a trait of the pagan, consistently putting their foot in their mouth. Peter did it yakata every time. Every single time you see Peter, his foot is in his, is in his mouth. In Matthew 16, 13 to 20, Jesus asked his disciples who they say he was. Peter responded, verse 16, You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. So we Jesus named him Peter or Petra and also proclaimed that the church will be built upon that revelation. It is therefore safe to say that a pagan believer knows stuff. He's not clueless. He knows stuff. Because imagine of everyone there was Peter that received the revelation. But how you know his maturity level, Matthew 14, 18 to uh, 28 and 29. Peter, the pagan believer, doesn't exactly play safe. Jesus was walking on water towards his disciples. Everyone is scared the moment, is scared. The moment Peter got a clue, it was Jesus. Even though he wasn't 100% sure, he proved him right away. He said, Jesus, if it is you, tell me to come. That's the hallmark of the pagan. He wants to experience everything that God has to offer. Whether he's ready or not is another conversation we will have. But he wants to enjoy or experience God consistently at a higher level. In Matthew 16, 21, verse 20, 20 to 21, Jesus reveals how things will unfold with him. Peter takes him aside to rebuke him. That is a very hilarious picture. Peter took the king of kings aside and said, Jesus, I rebuke you. <laughs> Classic pagan. The pagan believer is the one that doesn't know what pastor is saying in full. But his hand will shoot up. He's the first person to shoot up. Is I have a question. Pastor will say, ask the question. He'll say, pastor, you said it like this, but in this scripture, that's what they said. You are, con you know, you are because he doesn't know the fullness. But you see, if you, if you are paid on, we will cut you some slack. And if you have paid on believers around you, they mean well. Their heart is in a good place, okay? So cut them some slack as well. In uh, Matthew 17, verse 1 and verse 4, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to the Mount of Transfiguration. While the others were dazed by the glory, Peter suggested that they build shrines to immortalize the moment. The guy consistently wanted more. But because he's immature, the way he says it always comes out wrong. See, Matthew 26, Jesus tries to have a sober conversation about their fate after he was gone. And Peter assures him that others may fall, but he, he won't fall. He was even ready to die with Jesus. Guess what happens after? One small girl said, I know you, you look like you were with them. He said, me? God forbid, it's not me. That's the paid on believer. No. So what is the big pay, uh, focus of, for the paid on? What are the things that the paid on believer needs to know and needs to be aware of? Number one, the paid on believer must discipline his mind. Must discipline his mind to recognize that maturity is beyond, maturity is beyond knowing stuff. It requires the discipline to understand stuff 
and it requires the capacity to deploy stuff. So the paid on believer needs to take on board the need to discipline his mind. The paid on must understand that he may never fully know it all. He should be comfortable with that. After all, the Bible says we know in part and we prophesy in part. The paid on believer shouldn't feel um, less a Christian simply because he doesn't have all the answers. And that takes a bit of discipline and a whole lot of um, humility to be able to embrace that. Peter, do you know, do you love me? Jesus asked. The third time he realized that God didn't need him to be on top of his game. The first time they said, Peter, do you love me? John 21 said, you know, I love you now. Yes, I love you very well. Second time, oh, Jesus, are you even asking me? He was offended. You know, I love you. The third time he realized, he came to a bit of a realization. And then he said, okay, Lord, you know. It's only you can, that can tell because obviously I'm not um, able to convince you that I love you. He said, thou knowest, Lord. And that was the best answer ever. But see how long it took him to get to that answer. Paid on. That's their disease. The second thing that a paid on believer needs to be aware of is that a paid on believer needs to be, a refi be focused on refinement of temperament. If you hear believers who consistently say, that's just who I am, just respond by saying paid on. They may not even know the meaning of paid on, but just say it. Remind yourself that that's what is doing them. That's the disease. You say, you say, oh, but you should have said it a bit more nicely. And I can tell you because that stage of my life, I was horrible, I'm sure. Maybe today is a good day to apologize to everyone that I rubbed my Christianity in their faces. Today is a good, my husband is laughing. <laughs> and I, I think his laughter is, you still do pay it on for me. Okay, so I'm, I'm apologizing in advance, okay? <laughs> Refinement of temperament. Everything doesn't need to be dramatic. And everything is not about you as a paid on believer. By the time we get to um, the Acts of the Apostles, Peter had talk with the facts. You know, he wasn't playing all over the field. And in his first sermon, 3,000 people were added to the church in one day. Why? Because he had effectively, after his restoration in John chapter 1, he had sobered up and he started to mature. Hallelujah. The third thing that a paid on believer should try and focus on is control over his emotions. In John chapter 13, verse number 8. Chapter 13. Verse number eight, Peter said to Jesus, he said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. You will have no share in companionship with me. Verse nine, Simon, Simon Peter said, Lord, wash not only my feet, but my hands and my head too. Can you see it? You know, he's, he, he doesn't take the time to wait and allow something to land before he gives his response. So they said, Jesus is washing disciples' feet and wiping them. He gets to his turn and says, no, you are the king of, yeah, after all, you had Messiah the Christ. I can't let you wash my feet. Jesus said, okay, no problem. But if I don't wash your feet, you cannot be part of me. He said, ah, is that the case? Okay, bath me. <laughs> Can you see it? So um, control of emotions. To take a deep breath before you speak. To wait and allow the Holy Spirit minister to you before you draw conclusions. I have drawn many paid on conclusions in my lifetime as a, as a Christian. And it can be very humbling, if not humiliating, when you realize that you made major mistakes simply because you jumped to conclusions too early. 
okay so the pagan believer needs to discipline his mind he needs to learn refinement of temperament to recognize that he is on a path and the bible says that the path of the righteous as a shining light shineth brighter brighter unto a perfect day to recognize that he's not in the place of perfection yet and therefore people would push him to begin to get into the place of perfection the pagan believer needs to control his emotions and one of the things that i had to learn was not to say everything that i saw i actually think that now that i think about it i think that when I got in plenty trouble over being a pagan, I actually told God at some point, withdraw some of the gifts from me. Because if someone ain't walked into the room at that time, I could tell where he had been in the last three days. And it wasn't scary for me. I would just say, you, you were here, you were here, you were here. Of course, the people didn't like it. So I got in trouble. Until one day they escorted me. They said, just be going. They couldn't understand that it was a gift. They thought it was witchcraft. So they asked me to leave. When I went through that wilderness experience, if you like, I had to learn maturity. I had to learn that it's not everything that God shows you that you have to speak. And it's not everything. Some things you pray through. Other things you, you commit to those who are more experienced or are older or more matured in the work with God. So what is the, the learning curve of a pagan believer, therefore, is mastery. The learning curve of a pagan believer, therefore, is mastery. What does a pagan believer need to master if he will move to the next stage? Mastery is the watchword of a pagan believer. Pay attention. And that means that he must master authority, he must master submission, and he must master obedience. If you are in commanding your morning this morning, this is your bonus teaching. Because now I'm going to take my time to break it down master authority that he must get an understanding of what authority is master submission and master obedience why is this important because it is clear that the paid believer is grown or is growing has a relationship understands and knows god nature god's nature nature all of these things are evident in the, in his life but he will take an intentional effort to stay humble when you dreamt, you stopped, you say, oh, I dreamt and I saw Pastor Val wearing a pink shirt. You say it to Kenechi in the morning. In the afternoon, Pastor Val walks in and is wearing a pink shirt. It is difficult to be humble in those kind of cases. I know it doesn't happen to you, but it happens to me. So to recognize that without mastery, you can't be humble and stay humble. The three above, therefore, bring us to a place where we master ourselves the scripture says it like this that the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet the pagan believer allows his spirit to run away from him and it takes mastery to be able to recognize that i can hear from god and unless he tells me to repeat it i do not need to repeat it so authority what is authority therefore authority is the right capacity Control, competence to rule. If you go to, with me to Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29, verse number 2. When the uncompromisingly righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when the wicked man rules, the people groan and sigh. Many a people have groaned and sighed, not because and an uncompromised and not because a wicked man was in rulership but because an uncompromisingly righteous paid on believer was in was in authority so the paid on believer needs to recognize that authority that what makes a leader bad or what makes a leader bad is a combination of authority submission and obedience or a lack thereof once you don't understand it the tendency is you would use the, those authority wrong. So a pagan believer must know this and ensure that when he has the opportunity of an authority, he does not abuse it. Because remember we talked about he doesn't have boundaries, he has no filters, he's, um, he can be brash, 
But he knows God. He hears God. God tells him stuff. So unless if they put a paid on believer at the head of a team in church, the tendency is because he has no filters. All his teams will be, all his teammates will be upset with him. A long time ago, we had, now that I look at it, a paid on believer. He was, we were in ushering and he was our head of ushering. He would tell us to come for, um, to prepare church for service at 2 p.m., on Saturday and we already know that you dare not be late so most of us will get there at 1 30 1 45 he will stroll in at 3 30. of course before he comes we're already doing the things that we need to do we're swept we're arranging we're dusting then he'll come and he'll stand and he'll go like this and he'll watch the room and watch the room and then he will decide that the arrangement that Saturday was not the arrangement he wanted and that we should change the arrangement altogether. No, I'm sorry I'm late. No, oh, I apologize, I should have told you. And while you are at it, he will just be talking. Pay them. Did he love God? Yes, he did love God. Did he know how to lead others? Not quite. So a pagan believer must understand, must understand authority. Submission is the obedient attitude of those who command. Submission is the obedient attitude of those who obey a command, rather. The obedient attitude of those who follow a command, that's submission. Now the Padian believer must be able to see submission as how we learn to stay humble and how we learn stuff. The Padian believer has the tendency to obey without processing what he's obeying. And therefore he will be obeying, he is obeying but he will be saying something like, is it not because they chose you as my team lead? If the pastor knew what he was doing, he should not have picked you. Because that, I remember that in that our team, um, our ushering team, our team lead was the least educated. We had lawyers, we had pharmacists, we had bankers in our midst. Everyone was a professional. He was the one that was a trader. But he was the one that he would come and look at a lawyer of many years and just talk down at him. Of course, I was also a paid on believer at the time. So what did you think? I got angry many times. Okay. But the paid on believer recognizes that obedience is not complete without submission. He recognizes that obedience is not complete without submission. And so what he does by his attitude is to stay submitted. I remember then I would be so angry and my husband would say to me, take it easy. He wants us to do it this way because we're in the same department. Let, don't, you just don't worry. If you're upset, just wait. I will go and get it done. He used to rile me, but I mean, today I know that, that it was a function of how mature he was in the time. Um, because if Padian believer is very zealous and available, the tendency that he gets leadership positioning in church is very high. But every time you find a rancor before t within teams in church, look for the Padian. He's there in their midst because he's the one that causes all of the trouble. Now, in submitting, it is important that... Um, the pagan recognizes the importance of his motive. That is why is he submitting? And then he must be on top of his attitude. Am I submitting with the right body language? So when you are a pagan, you, you know enough to, that this is the work of God, so you should contribute your bit. The thing is not that you will not do, is that you will do it grumbling. Meanwhile, if you did anything for God grumbling, the tendency is there is no reward. You just had your reward by satisfying your bad attitude. To refuse to submit at the pagan stage is to run the risk of derailing in future. 
And so the thing to remember about the pagan stage of or, or, or the pagan believer is that your greatness is already ad identified. And what this face is for is for molding you to become. When you are a pagan believer, your leaders already know you have great potential. They know God has called you. At this stage, let me apologize again to everyone who was in the room the day I taught my first ever sermon. I'm sure I wasn't nice. I, I, I can't remember the message, but I remember the reaction of some elderly people a few days later. So I'm sure I wasn't quite nice. I chalk it off to being a pagan, okay, but I apologize. The point is that leaders can see that God has his hand on you as a paid unbeliever. The Lord, the Lord himself is speaking through you. But you have not learned the wisdom to be able to couch your conversation properly. And so you get to offend a lot of people. But when you learn submission, you take the great things that God has spoken to you and you submit them to the person of the Holy Spirit so that he speaks through you to be so that you, when you people hear you, they know that in your capacity as a person, you are not the one speaking, but God is speaking through you. Pagan believers tend to run amok. The word is God's, but the delivery is not God's. The top thing that I said that the pagan believer needs to master you know, is obedience. I talked about, what did I talk about? I talked about authority, how to handle authority. I talked about, um, what's the other thing? Submission and now obedience. The activity, obedience is the activity that follows a command. Every pagan believer must move from talking about what they know and move into the place of doing what they are asked. There are two different things. The pagan believer likes to talk about, if, if a pagan believer is in a Bible study, he will interrupt the teacher 55 times because the scripture that the teacher is teaching, God just spoke to him about it today. And so he will consistently be interjected because it is somehow necessary for him to show that he has Rema as well. But when he learns maturity, he's able to recognize his, um, the motive for why he's making his contribution. He's able to discern the time when his contribution would be, um, would, would be proper to make. So you find out that the pagan believer must move from talking about what he knows to doing what he's asked. Now, one of the biggest tests of the freedom stage of, of being a believer is that leaders who are very, um, who are mature and understand what it is that I'm talking about now, always give the pagan assignment that he hates. And the reason is because they recognize that the pagan needs to learn humility. He's anointed by humility is of essence. He's anointed by humility is of essence. He's anointed by if he doesn't learn in humility, he will mess it up. So you find them, they should have made him the Sunday school teacher. They put him in, um, um, what's that thing called? Cleaning duty, sanitation duty. He's angry. But he, he needs to learn to do what he's told with all the praying in tongues he knows how to quote, scriptures he knows how to quote. If he would not have the right attitude washing the toilets, he would have a stinky attitude teaching. And so the tutor, the, the governor, is the one that would take him and say, no, I know you can teach, but I'm not putting you in teaching. Go and join the sanitation department. I know you have a great voice, but we're not going to put you in worship. You can join them to do rehearsals, but on Sunday, you are in, um, what's the holy police? You are outside, you are parking cars. Until the paid unbeliever learns humility, those things can be very upsetting. Okay? Now, if you've passed all of these faces that I'm talking about, I'm sure you understand what I'm saying now. It is expedient that we don't forget that our big thing as paid unbelievers is to humble ourselves and learn. It is expedient that you understand that. Every pagan believer must understand and live 
in the culture of honor. Because it is the one culture that the pagan is very quick, is very quick to contravene honor. The pagan believer must learn to honor position, even when the position does not have the anointing that it has, he has. The pagan believer must learn to honor age, even when he's wiser than that one that is older than him. The pagan believer must learn to honor experience, to know that some things come to us by experience and not by, um, and not by how much Bible you read. The pagan believer needs to, how to learn how to honor knowledge, to recognize that wisdom is the, co uh, the correct application of knowledge. And that the Bible says in Isaiah 33, verse 6, that wisdom and stability is the, is the what of our times. Wisdom and knowledge are the stability of our times, yes. So the pagan believer also needs to recognize and honor value. So recognize that when people bring value, we ought to be grateful. We shouldn't, um, what's the word I'm looking for? We shouldn't downplay the efforts of others simply because we feel that they are not as spiritual as we are. These things are real. If you're looking at the, your life, even if, <coughs> looking, if you're doing a playback, you will see these things had manifested in your life at some point. Now, I wish I learned this the moment I got born again. Maybe I would have done better. And the operative word is maybe, maybe, maybe not. Maybe we all have to go through it to learn it. But maybe, maybe not. You get it. But to do well as a pagan believer, you must honor. You must live in the culture of honor. To give weight. To give weight to people in position and people in authority. To give weight and honor to those who are older than us. To give way to those who are younger than us but have more experience. To give weight to those who have more knowledge, even if they are younger than us. All of this, to not live in honor as a pagan believer is to mortgage your future. Now let me explain that to you. What will happen as a pagan believer who doesn't live in honor is that you will soon leave your, lose your tutor and you'll soon lose your governor because you will frustrate them out of your life. And as long as those people are not in your life, the tendency is you may never be able to get to where you need to get to. To not live in honor is to mortgage your future. I heard um, Pastor Cindy Trim say one time that we live forward, but we learn backwards. We live forward, but we learn backwards. So to recognize that to grow through the pagan stage, we shouldn't forget that even when we have no understanding, God is working things out. Because that's one of the big frustrations of a pagan believer. They want God to do what he has said and they want it done now. But God tends to understand that most of us need to be processed before we can lay hold on the things that he has spoken. The difficulty we, pay, we face as paid, on, as paid on believers is that we now know our God enough to see what he is capable of doing in us, with us and through us. And then we find ourselves struggling to contain this understanding or this revelation on the inside of us while we still do things that are just in our estimation going through the motions. If God has called me, if I have dreamt and I saw myself preaching to a stadium of people, why is my pastor asking me to park cars? Meanwhile, he has brother this and brother that and sister that who don't know where to find Genesis in the Bible. But they're on the teaching staff. Or the, yes, the teaching, they're teaching pastors. I am filled of this thing. In fact, I preach in my dream. And God has told me that that's what he's called me to do. Why exactly am I outside parking cars? Many paid believers have moved from one church to another church. And the thing that frustrates them to move from one church to the other church to the other church to the other church is that 
pagan believers believe that because they are that good at the level that they are, somebody must give them a platform. The greatest hunger of a pagan believer is platform. We need to recognize that the biggest gift we can give ourselves as pagan believers is to recognize that there is a time for everything so that we can align accordingly, according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. If we go back to Luke chapter 2, in verse 51 and 52, Jesus, even Jesus, went down to Nazareth with his parents. He was subject to them, and therefore he increased in wisdom and in stature. We're looking at these stages of maturation because there are too many immature believers in the body of Christ. And I think that it's not because we have chosen to be immature. We've just, it's just because no one is probably taught us like this. So we don't um, quite understand the process. So today's teaching may sound really intellectual, I don't know. But the idea is if you don't know the process, you would always fall foul of it. And God, this is part of the protocol of maturation. And until we learn it, the tendency is that there are many things that we will never be able to lay our hands on. Now, I am of the school of thought that if God spoke it and if he's put it in my DNA, I should leave it before the end of my life. So whatever it is that is going to stop me from leaving it and leaving it well, I am willing to submit and surrender and do whatever I need to do to ensure that I get where I need to go. That's what this is about for me. If I knew this those years, many years ago, I probably would have done better. I promise you I would have done better. I want to believe that when God teaches me, I tend to learn and I tend to obey. But I didn't know. And because I didn't know, I hurt many people along the way. Sometimes I think about it and I say, I hope nobody that I hurt left the faith for good. Hope not. Now today we have pastors who are practically paid on believers. Now you need to watch out what is happening in those congregations. We have heads of departments who are paid on believers. And what I have learned is that as pastors, if you lead a flock, you need to learn that availability and giftedness is not all that is required to assume positions of authority in the body. So that we are not the ones that are consistently breaking ourselves. Many paid on believers are still very um, um, what's the word I want? Their character is still forming. So you find paid on believers in adultery. You find paid on believers in sexual immorality. You find paid on believers giving bribes and taking bribes. Yes, they are gifted. God has called them. But they need to go through the processes. So if you are a pastor, for instance, I, I, I tend to, the moment I see giftedness, I begin to look for mastery. If I don't see mastery, I can keep you at the back for a really long time. I know that that helped me because when eventually I was cut loose, I had to go back to God and I had to let God teach me. And that's how I was better and better. And I'm still getting better. I'm sure that my husband would have a different story to tell, but I promise you I am getting better. Now, this is not to make anyone sad. Neither is this to judge anybody. If you notice, I'm a lot calmer teaching this class. I'm teaching it this calm because I don't want anyone to sense that I'm judging them. And I want you to put your hand to the plow to get better. Because there is so much work. The Bible says that the harvest is plenty and the laborers are few. There is so much work ahead of us. And because God does for us to do, we cannot afford to be making the mistakes that we're making at the level of the pagan believer. 
So if you are here and you have not given your life to Jesus, you want to pray and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. And for the rest of us, you want to pray, especially if you think that you are at the level of the pagan believer now. Now, I know that a lot of us will not agree because humility is not a pagan believer. But I'm hoping that you will hear the heart of God this afternoon or this evening and you will surrender so that he will take you through the process of mastery. The moment you can master authority, the moment you can master submission, the moment you can master obedience, I promise you, your space is waiting for you. You would always get there. But when you do get there because you have obtained mastery in this level, at this level, the tendency is you will be more useful to the people than judgmental and rude and brash and all of those things. So I want you to pray this afternoon and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, help me to be the right kind of pagan. Help me. I've seen the lapses. I've seen the gaps. Lord, I want to fill these gaps. Will you help me? And if you have not given your life to Jesus, I'll make this call again. Let me appeal to you to take the step today and pray with me and say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Because when you do that, then he will position you around tutors and governors. And he would allow them to take you through the process so that you can arrive where it is that you're going. I also want to take the time to thank God for the tutors and the, part and the governors that he's put in my life through this time. Some of my tutors and governors were not people. They were circumstances, and they were really hard and bad circumstances. But I'm grateful to God that he taught it wise at that stage of my life to take me through all of those things, because that's why I'm able to keep standing today. Father, Lord, I am grateful for everyone and every circumstance you used to process me to this point. Lord, I'm submitting myself again to whatever further processing you need to take me through for the journey that is ahead. Lord, my prayer every day, and it is my prayer now, is that I will never let go of your hand. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for loving me the way you've loved me. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining the service today. Um, tomorrow morning at 5 a.m., we will um, be gathering again for commanding your morning, our early morning prayer and teaching call. Um, the seven-day prayer is going to begin in this new week and on the 1st of July and all the other things that we do. You're welcome to send us a message. Um, you're welcome to... Show, um, to ask me questions if you have any, if you send me um, um, an inbox message, I promise you I usually always respond. I may not respond immediately, but I usually always respond. Thank you so much. It's been my honor to bring this word to you. God bless you and have a fantastic week ahead of you. May those blessings manifest every step of the way in Jesus' name. Bye-bye.